Hi everyone, I'm Susan Dackerman, the director of the Cantor Arts Center, uh, broadcasting from Los Angeles today, where I am sheltering in place. And I thank you all for being here for this conversation with Deborah Cass, who, as I hope all of you know, is the artist who made Oyo, the monumental sculpture that now sits in the front plaza in front of the museum and has become such a significant um, icon for us. So I thought this would be a really nice opportunity since we're all at home to have this conversation with Deborah. Deb, thank you so much for being here. It's a thrill to be here with you. Uh, where are you broadcasting from? I'm broadcasting from East Atlantic Beach, Long Island, New York, a very small little village in the town of Hempstead that's um, at the beach. So I'm five houses from the ocean and I'm in a bungalow. Uh, that sounds great. Um, Deborah and I actually, uh, uh, share not exactly a hometown but we grew up two towns away on Long Island and so the beach where Deb is right now is very familiar to me as my um, high school stomping ground so it's a very beautiful location um, so let's talk about your work and its presentation in front of the canter and uh, work you've done before this. I have constructed a little bit of a PowerPoint so that to get the conversation going. And I thought I would start by talking about my introduction to your work, really. Um, I went back and looked online to find the date and I was able to go back to images from 2007 from Kasman Gallery in Chelsea, New York, where walking around Chelsea one day, I walked into an exhibition called Feel Good Paintings for Feel Bad Times. And I loved them. Uh, I love the use of language. I love the palette of them. I love the uh, use of song lyrics and the riffing off um, well-known artistic styles, but doing it in your own idiosyncratic way. Will you tell us a little bit about the paintings? Yeah, sure. Um, well, Feel Good Paintings for Feel Bad Times was um, one of my many reactions to the Bush administration, which now feels like the good old days. And um, to the Iraq war and the general malaise of the time, which again, does seem like the good old days. Um, and uh, I had started a series of drawings at a certain point, um, I think when I turned 50. And I was thinking a lot about my earliest influences, my uh, passions and combining my love of sort of um, post-war American painting, New York school painting, pop art, minimalism, and something I consider deeply middle class, which is not art, but Broadway. So uh, I was I think part of it was a reaction to Bush and his assault on the middle class, which suddenly made the thing I was most embarrassed about as a young artist really important to me as an older artist, which was the concept of the middle class. And while it was the world's most embarrassing thing to me as a young artist, although when I looked around, everyone else in Tribeca and Soho was from New Jersey, Long Island, or Westchester, or <laughs> Connecticut, from middle class families, but we were very boho. And um, that was sort of a, an embarrassment. Anyway, with the destruction, that, which started with Reagan, the, the actual targeting 
of the American middle class, which to me was responsible for some of the greatest culture produced in post-war America. So, like, like Broadway, like post-war painting. What are your favorites? Oh, geez. You know, I'm an old school gal. So I think my favorite, I mean, I, I mean, I have to go back to, I had this moment in high school. I always was going to be an artist. I always knew I was going to be an artist. But someone I knew from summer camp was in the chorus of a Broadway show. And it wasn't that Eileen Schatz was in the chorus of Henry Sweet Henry, but it really <laughs> yanked my chains in terms of, I don't know what, it just did. It just did. I had this moment. I thought maybe I'll go to, into the theater, whatever. But when I got sort of obsessed when I turned 12 with Oliver, that was my first Broadway obsession. I don't know why. I think my friend had gone and seen it. And so for my 12th birthday, my, my grandparents took us to see it. And it, uh, by that time, it's like kids with Hamilton now. I knew every word. I knew every song. And, it, you know, Broadway, you know, that, that led to me being a little older and the idea of Funny Girl and Barbra Streisand looking like people I knew, which then led to, I was old enough to go to art school with our mutual friend, Kim Thompson on Saturday mornings. And often I would take myself to the theater after with my portfolio. And then particularly great shows like Mame I knew when the when the when the intermission was, so I was obsessed with Mame, because probably I was obsessed with Anti Mame when I was six, the first time I saw that movie when it came out, and uh, I would see the second act of shows my favorites over and over. So when you ask me my favorites, I go back to that time, and it really is Mame, Fiddler. I never really liked Hello Dolly, although I saw every cast, including Pearl Bailey. Um, but I go further back to Guys and Dolls, South Pacific. You know, I like the classics. And I think Guys and Dolls might, might be my favorite, something I definitely did not, never saw in its original production. This Daddy, I Would Love to Dance, isn't that from um, a chorus line? Well, that's a little later, and yes, and that's, that's thank you for bringing that up. That be, that, that's my later thing. That's when I sort of, in my whenever, Chorus Line happened in 75, I think. Oh, I should also say, I went to the first production of Hair when I was 15 in 1967, when it was in a nightclub because I fell asleep in, as a sophomore in English class. And we had this whole slew of new groovy teachers at Southside Senior High School in Long Island. They were in their twenties and she kind of woke me up. She was new and she called me up and she said, I think you should go into Manhattan and see this thing called hair at this club called the Cheetah. So I did. And then I saw it at the public. So it, we're going in, a little fast, but Chorus Line was done, I think in 75, I was 23. I had zero interest in Broadway. I was a hip New York artist. All of that kind of stuff was really verboten and of no interest to me. All, you know, that just disappeared. You know, I was interested in art at the beach and on the beach and, you know, uh, Gordon Mata Clark and, you know, a whole other, I was on the Whitney program. It was a whole other gestalt and aesthetic. I came back after never seeing Chorus Line because I was completely uninterested. I think in its 15th year, might've been 20th. They did this whole big thing about it being 15 or 20. I have to look at the, I guess it was 20. And uh, I went to the revival and I became completely obsessed in the way I used to be obsessed when I was a teenager with certain shows. I was obsessed. It was my childhood. It was my aspiration. It was my ambition. It was my conflicts in my twenties. No wonder I didn't want to see it then. But seeing it whenever 45 was utterly life-changing. So tell us what then it becomes to make it into a painting like this that is based on, to my eyes, a Frank, uh, an Ellsworth Kelly palette and a Frank Stella. Uh, uh, it's Frank Stella. That's Frank just a Frank Stella idiom. That's Jasper's Dilemma, half of it. 
It's exactly what it is. So um, I did, as you know, many iterations of Daddy, I Would Love to Dance, which for uh, people who don't know is cut three on the CD. It's Everything Was Beautiful. I think it's called At the Ballet. And it's the women singing about being young and being kids and going to ballet class and what it meant to them and what kind of family situations they were involved in. And uh, Daddy, I Would Love to Dance is, uh, the, Maggie is the character, she says, we used to dance, we used to dance around the living room and he would say, Maggie, would you love, would you like to dance? And I'd say, Daddy, I would love to dance. So this is the first big emotional for me moment in Chorus Line, which has, of course, significance to me personally. And um, it became the basis of, I don't know how many paintings I did, six, seven, eight more, I don't know. Um, and uh, it's combining this emotional crescendo in a language completely outside of art that's primarily a middle-class white language of Broadway with my first loves in art. And I have used Andy Warhol in these paintings. I've used Frank Stella in these paintings, Ellsworth Kelly always. These are my daddies and they were my first loves also in art. So I was bringing together all of that. Um, and that's how, the, did that answer the question? Yeah, it's a really great answer that okay. uh, you're able to tie the daddy back into your art world uh, mentors and- um, right. which is a lot of what my work's about. So, you know, I do not, while I critique these guys for their really one dimensional view of the world, and I really seek to open, the, open up their language to reflect myself, it's coming out of my first loves, my first love. It's total adoration of post-war American, New York painting, really New York. I mean, it's very provincial. Everything's very New York, even the words. New York painting, uh, New York's Broadway. Um, New York middle York, class, New York, New York suburbs where now I'm yep. living, weirdly, in isol you know, in sheltering in place in Nassau County, Long Island, New York, where every single one of my best friends grew up. We couldn't wait to leave. <laughs> and here I am. Um, it happens. <laughs> um, it, it didn't happen to anyone else, I, not my crowd. <laughs> I'm the only one. Um, so you also mentioned Andy Warhol and, um, here is an example of you riffing off Andy Warhol and instead of uh, using a photograph of Jackie Onassis, Jackie Kennedy in 1964, you used Barbara Streisand and called the seri series Jewish Jackies. Uh, what does appropriation mean to you? Because clearly it is a huge part of your work. You know, I think it, it is something like the language of my milieu and my artistic generation. Um, my contemporaries are Cindy Sherman and David Sally and uh, Sherry Levine and Barbara Kruger. And I think, you know, for me, I just, took Andy's thing a step further and saw art history as a ready-made and something to be used. So I did that 10 years after that, this, in those feel-good paintings was the same premise. Like, this is just a language. I can use it to speak for me, as Adrian Rich said, this is the oppressor's language, yet I needed to speak to you. And I was, which was a real uh, profound, Adrian Rich was a profound influence, but that particular line from, uh, what's the poem? From a Survivor, I think is the name of that poem. And um, so uh, appropriation was, could be a feminist intervention into languages that already exist. And that's how I've used it. 
consistently? Um, I'm not going in chronological order here. I'm just doing a little survey of work that you've done until we can get to Oyo, but this is another Warhol appropriation, uh, Warhol's great vote McGovern, which you riff on here uh, for the 2016 election. Any comment? Oh, yeah, sure. Um, I really dusted Andy off for this. I hadn't done a Warhol image in 16 years. And I actually wanted to do it for Bush's second Bush v. Gore. I mean, Bush v. Kerry. And I went to Ron Feldman to do it and say, because he's a, he, Ronald Feldman was a Democratic, um, what do you call him when they go on the floor for the convention? Delegate. Delegate? Delegate. Yep. Yeah. I mean, very involved with the Democratic Party, was a delegate, was always fundraising for these things. So before that election, I brought the idea to him, but he didn't want to do it for whatever reason. And um, that was 2004. But in 2016, I was really in a different place to be able to get this done. And um, I was lucky enough to be connected enough to the campaign, to Hillary, to get this through to James Carville. And Carville said, I want it. So there were two official prints for Hillary. One was by Chuck Close and one was by me. And whatever the official fundraising print meant, that's this what this was. And it was so much better now than for Bush. I mean, it was just so much better now. And, and uh, you know, I knew then in 2004, I'll definitely have another opportunity whenever it is. This is an idea that needs to happen. Could not have been at a better time. And honestly, I'm prouder of this piece of work than almost anything because it just combined all everything and promoted the person who has been my hero since I was 17. And she gave her commencement address at Wellesley and it was all over the local news. And I was like riveted by this girl giving this address for commencement, the first student ever to give an address the commencement address. She was on the cover of Life, I think, or In Life, whatever. Like, this girl just was a thing for me. And her reemergence as the First Lady, you know, just reminded me. So, you know, I'll never, ever be in love with a candidate like I was in love with Hillary, because I can't take another disappointment on that level, which I'll, I will take to my grave. But I was so proud to be involved in the campaign. I was so proud to be, to raise the amount of money this print raised. And by the way, it was the same size as Andy's. It was this, we would have used the same paper, but they don't make it anymore. It was the same size edition with the same amount of APs and the same price without adjustment for inflation. So it was a guarantee to sell and it did and um, when I met her the first time at a very small gathering, I turned to Patty, my wife, and just, I was so in shock that I was talking to her. I said, what did we talk about? And she said, the print. You <laughs> talked about the print. Anyway, I, I was invited to the convention. We were, I was told to get my hotel ready for the inauguration, which I booked, because we were going. And, you know, so this is, I was so proud. And I got my wonderful Brand X printers to donate their time. And it just, that that's what this was. So I'm, I'm so proud of it. And it really, it, it, Chuck said, why is Deb getting all this press? Why isn't my print getting all this press? So it was just phenomenal. It was, I was so happy to do it. Well, when we installed the sculpture, Oyo, in front of the canter, we were offered this print as a gift. So we now have an impression of it at the canter as well, and we're really delighted to have it. 
um, we don't have the Warhol, but you need to get the Warhol. I know we need to get the Warhol. Yeah. Cornell um, has them. The museum has them side by side. Where is it that they're side by side? I think it's at Cornell. Everson? Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. One of these days. Yes. You need someone to donate that print to you. We do. We I'm do. pitching. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, let's talk about Oyo since it is uh, what connects us to the canter and um, how did you actually get started on those two tiny little words that have so much meaning and so much resonance? Um, it was on a regular trip to MoMA, which happens, you know, now and then. And um, I was just standing in front of Ed Ruscha's oof and the light bulb went off as sometimes we're lucky and that happens. Just like uh, Daddy, I Would Love to Dance, I actually dreamt that first one I did. I dreamt the image, woke up, drew it out, then proceeded to make whatever, eight paintings out of it. This was that kind of moment where I'm looking at Oof by the great Ed Ruscha. Just thought, oi. <laughs> so did the painting. It was up at my gallery at the time and there was a fantastic reflection in the window that said, yo. So I said to my a friend, should I paint it? And she said, of course you should paint it. So I painted it. It's not always that easy, but when it is, it's just a delight. And it's unusual, it's, it, you know, it's artwork for a reason, it's not art play. But when, when it happens like that, it's a gift. And this yep. was a gift. So then it was just a matter of, well, why can't I see it at the same time? Wait a minute, wait a minute, this should be an object that can be viewed in either direction. So I am lucky enough to work with a fabulous print publisher, Lococo Fine Art in St. Louis, who also does multiples for Alex Katz and Donald Batchelor, does a lot of metal work, you know, works with a fabricator. So we cooked it up and we cooked up a 10 inch by 20 inch version. And um, it was great. And a few years later, maybe four years later or so, just had this opportunity to make a giant sculpture. So it was kind of a no brainer. It's like, uh, here we go, we can make this big. And that's where opportunity comes in. And it was just this fantastic opportunity. And um, women don't generally get public sculpture at that point. 2015, having a monumental public sculpture in New York City by a female was extremely unusual. I can't even really, Ursula von Reigensvard, um, not that many others come to mind. So, you know, it was, it was just, as we say in Yiddish, Beshert, it was just luck. It was just lucky. Got to make it. Two Trees um, developers, which uh, have developed all of Dumbo, had a project called Art in Dumbo. So they paid for the fabrication. And the fabricator who made the little guys made the giant one. And we shipped it from St. Louis. And it arrived and got installed the way yours got installed, different substructure, because it was in the ground. And, but got, you know, lit, yep. you know, just sort of put into the pipes and boom, there it was looking absolutely fantastic. I don't have a picture of the installation in Brooklyn uh, at the base of the Brooklyn Bridge. Uh, but, you know, those of you who are watching can certainly Google Oyo yeah. you know, Brooklyn Bridge and they're a great Dumbo, Brooklyn, Dumbo, really, it was it between, online. literally smack between the Brooklyn Bridge and the Manhattan Bridge. So it is parallel to the shoreline, looking straight at uh, Manhattan. And when you look at Manhattan, it says Oi. And then when you turn around and look back at Brooklyn, 
up at these beautiful buildings in Dumbo, these beautiful 19th century industrial buildings, it says Yo. So, you know, there was a little bit of question which should be which, but I thought Yo Brooklyn was a no-brainer. And Hoy Manhattan is also a no-brainer. So here we are in the truck. So here we are at uh, Yo Stanford and Yo Cantor. So, you know, I saw it there um, on the banks of the East River. And uh, I just found it so, I don't know, magical. Like it just, when I first saw it, it just made me laugh. Um, and then, you know, thinking about the address from the two sides being so different and uh, what was offered visually and linguistically. And at the time, we at the museum at Stanford were thinking about uh, a sculpture that could uh, be in the courtyard of the museum. There's an open courtyard. We'll bring you there after all this is over. I can't wait to see it. <laughs> I know. Um, and um, one, uh, a friend of the cantor, Debbie Wish, and I, uh, who lives in New York and um, knew the sculpture in Brooklyn, started talking about this work. And we knew it wasn't right for the courtyard, but wondered what it would be like out in front of the museum as an address to the campus, as well as, um, an address to those leaving the museum. And um, so as, as you know, what we did was we made at the museum a two scale cardboard maquette painted yellow. It wasn't your Lamborghini yellow, but it was a very close approximation and we started moving those two letters around, trying to find the right place for it <laughs> in proximity to uh -huh. the museum. And if you recall, you knew we were doing this because as soon as we started moving those letters around, people, students who were riding by on their bicycles, people who were walking around the museum, started taking photographs and posting it on Instagram. And I right. knew like I had to call you and let you know what we were doing before you saw on Instagram that we had made a replica of your sculpture that we were uh, moving around on um, wheels essentially. Yeah, it was really a shocker when I saw it on Facebook. I didn't really know what I was looking at. Yeah. <laughs> I, I really thought, did somebody do a Photoshop thing? Why is my sculpture here? We're trying to figure out what is it going to look like? Right. Where was the right place for it? And you know, the best way to do that is to uh, make a replica. But you know, in these days when images travel so quickly and uh, you know, you could be alerted to something that we were doing in Palo Alto, you know, within moments. Um, I, we just hadn't anticipated that would be the case. But we, do, we did realize how great it was going to look in front of the museum and how um, much work it was going to do towards updating the facade, beckoning people, and really letting people know, like, we're a museum here. We've got great art here. So, um, I guess, so I wonder what you think, like that of it being placed right in front of a classical facade like this, because I know it's also, there's also uh, a version out of it out in front of the Brooklyn Museum, but it's not cited in the same way. Uh, would you mind talking about your thoughts about the sculpture out in front of museums and well, of course, I think that's where it belongs. So, you know, it, it's, it, it's every artist's dream. So it's like, 
oh yes, well that's exactly where it should go. Now I love it in front of the Greek revival, um, which you know also remember the Brooklyn Museum before the Jim Polshek thing. The building itself is Stanford White, you know, so it's also very classical. They're um, built within a few years of one another. The two buildings. Yeah, well, that makes perfect sense. So, um, you know, as far as the orientation, if I was to have been consulted, no reason why you would have, I would have done it exactly as you did it because you want to welcome people. Now in Brooklyn, it goes perpendicular to, and so there was definite conversation about what should face west towards Manhattan, but also towards Park Slope, and what should face east, which is Crown Heights, which is a heavily Hasidic, Jewish, and Black community. So there was a little like, whoa, how do we work this out? And I think it just came down to simply when I said, when you People come out of the subway from the west side and you see you approach the entrance. So basically in a meeting, I just said, do you, re do you really want people to come out of the, like, it's actually like you're thinking. Do you want people to come out of the subway, be approaching the entrance to the museum and see, oi? Or do you want people to come out of the museum, approach the entrance and it go, hello, yo. So that would, that kind of ended that conversation because there was some, like, well, if the, I think if they could have afforded it, they would have put it on a turntable. So <laughs> they could have just changed it when they felt like it, which would have been fine with me. It actually, it would have been amazing. But, you know, so this made the most, this made a lot of sense. Yeah. Tell us about the making of it, because these are your guys who are here in Palo Alto installing it, aren't they? It's okay. So basically, Lococo is my print publisher who then published, he published, you know, the small multiples. Um, Nick is the fabricator. Nick bounced it up. He did the, all the engineering for it or worked with someone, you know, he figures out everything. So Nick has been on this um, since the first installation. He organized the trucks, organized everything, the lifting, the putting down. Nick came to the first installation. He came to the deinstallation in Dumbo, came to the installation at the new um, North 6th Street Ferry in Williamsburg, came for the deinstallation, which then went on a truck back to him. Then he came to Brooklyn to oversee the installing, came to Brooklyn to see what the engineering situation was, worked with their engineers. So he came for that installation. It was also a little bit late. So I was in London and I watched it on FaceTime. But as you know, it's pretty quick. So oh, yeah. it was fun to watch long distance. So, but Nick's been to more than I have. So then Nick deinstalled it. Well, now it's there. Now it's there. So yeah. Nick fabricated it, the piece, brought it out to you. I don't know what happened. Did he come out to see? everything and where it was going to be installed? Or did no, you I, that had all been communicated uh, by phone. And I mean, we had a million conversations with him before he came. But then, you know, the two letters arrived on a truck one very early morning. You think it's Sesame Street <sighs> and it it's was, a toy truck. It was actually amazing. You know, it arrived, it was barely light out. And um, half the staff at the museum was there to see it installed. I mean, there were people working on the installation, and then there were uh, those of us who just wanted to see the magic of it arrive on the truck. And um, in this image on the right, you can see the crane actually lifting the first letter off the truck, which was incredibly nerve-wracking if uh, you are the director of the museum watching the artwork I imagine. hoisted into the air. Um, you can see the pole that they get lowered down to. Yeah, I think on the next, and then in this other image is, uh, I just want to show, um, 
is me here with um, Fred Remus. He and his family and Debbie and Steve Wish and their families made bringing um, the sculpture possible uh, to Stanford. So Fred came down at the crack of dawn to watch this as well. Debbie was in New York or on. Uh, thank you, Fred and family. family. Thank you, Debbie Wish and family. Uh, Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, we are. I so can't wait great. to thank them in person. To be honest, I really can't. Uh, but here is the O being lowered down onto um, the, the two mansions. Yeah, and so the letters are metal, aluminum. highly aluminum, um, painted, highly finished, and hollow. And they sit uh, on these two posts. It's kind of amazing, the engineering of it. It is. It is. And, um, the, you know, there. Are, uh, one thing I want to say is there was conversation with you guys about the, um, what do you call it? The base. Thank you. The base. And I love this base. Oh, good. I'm so glad. You I know, think it was the, I think it's so the right thing. And um, I knew it would be. And there was a big conversation about it with Lococo. And I'm like, cement's the right thing to do. It's very organic. It's what it's on. It makes perfect sense. And we know the proportions of it based on, you know, the, the base is always to the end of the letters. You know, there's like a whole little thing we all know now. And, but I do love that base. And because it's the most, um, it's just uh, there, it's just right, it's just right. It, it's not uh, distracting, it's perfect. And- um, The cement is the same color as the cement that it's sitting on. As it should be, yeah. Which is, um, which turned out to be difficult for us to, we thought we were just gonna be able to order cement. Oh. Uh, but Stanford has its own cement color and mixture. So oh. that is, Stanford cement color. So and I, I'm, I'm assuming it'll weather and really blend in at some point. Yes, um, I think that that's the idea, that it's all always the same color. And even if it didn't, it would still look good, but I, I assume that would, that would happen. And as far as the finish, this, you know, when people ask me about it, I go, it's a car. It's, it's sprayed in a booth like a car, it's Lamborghini yellow like a car, and then it's clear coated like a car and wax like a car. So in theory, you just maintain it like a car. You'll need to wax it at some point like a car. And it's, it, it just is a car. Yeah, I think Nick, when it was installed, Nick then waxed it. Oh yeah. Um, and showed our preparators, I think, how to wax it. Uh, when that, when it's necessary. Or you could just hire some car guys. Or just hire some car guys. They'll know how to wax it, but you know, it's really simple. Not that I have ever waxed a car, but I hear. Yeah. Not that hard. So yeah. It's so this is of course on the left, the view from the museum steps. Um, and you can see it and it looks down this, you know, fantastic alley towards the Bing Performing Arts Center on campus. So it's really this great arts corridor. And when you are at the other end of it, at the Bing coming out from a performance, uh, you see the museum and the yo beckoning. Um, I think it's really visually compelling. I think they need one and it should face the other direction so they speak to each other. Uh, and would theirs uh, say yo as well, or would they? No, it would, it would have to say, wait a minute, what would it say? It would have to say oi. I think it would have to say oi. It has to say oi. Um, and I think it sends the wrong message about the Performing Arts Center, which is great, but <laughs> it's, a, I like the. Uh, It'll look good. That's all I care about. of it. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, we have the possibility here for people to ask questions if they okay. want to go to the chat function uh, on this webinar and type in a question. Um, and you won't see the question, but I'll see the question and I will read it. Uh, so if people would like to do that. 
Um, but we hope, Deb, that once we are beyond this crisis, that you will come out to Stanford, see the work in person and uh, do a program with us, with the students, um, with our members and, you know, with the public that has really uh, come to enjoy seeing it out there. Well, I would love to. Uh, well, we will make that possible, um, hopefully, you know, in the coming year. So um, I think that we've done a really uh, uh, sort of comprehensive lead up to the OIO. Do you have anything else you would like to say? No, um, I'm happy to answer any questions and I'm just thrilled it's there. I really am. I think it's, it's an ideal, absolutely ideal uh, location, installation, I, I really get what it does for the museum and it's, it's, you know, sometimes things are perfect. This is pretty perfect. Okay, so we have a question from the audience that says, um, that asks, could you talk a little about the multiple languages that the sculpture uh, references? You know, I'm laughing because to me, the first two languages are minimalism and pop art, so. <laughs> Well, those are languages, yeah, uh, <laughs> and multiculturalism. So yes. you know, it's my th three passions. So those are the languages I went to right away. But I think you mean yo and oi. Um, so what's the question? The question is two well, letters. Two letters well, can do a lot of work. I actually think you answered it. That the the important languages for you are pop art and minimalism and uh you know and I think it's why this work is so powerful because it does um speak so many languages including yeah, and, and English Yiddish Japanese someone told me that um, yes yo was also a phrase in Portuguese yep and and there's a, a English thing boy except it's oi but it sounds the same it's like almost like hello so it's almost like yo so yes it is in multiple languages and you know now looking back on this I think of this as you know I think of Obama and the administration and I think of Hamilton and I think of the gorgeous multi rainbow coalition that was Hamilton and what Hamilton means. And I think of this as my Hamilton Obama moment that where you unbeknownst to you and just, you know, or intentionally speak to enormous amounts of people at once. And with your own specificity that relates to everybody, so many other people's specificity with two little letters. And it, it, it was, it, it's almost a miracle. I mean, it, it's just like, so of course, oi is Yiddish, of course, it's New York, of course, and of course, so is yo, and you can start with uh, Rocky Bilbao saying yo, Adrian, and go down through, up through, neighborhoods and communities of color and yo and hip hop. So, and then never to forget, yo means I am in Spanish. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it, it is absolutely wild that these two letters are applicable in so many different languages and culture, so yeah. cultures. So, so you mention, um, you know, the, the historical, how this works historically and it fits into this Obama moment. Um, what is it, have you thought about its resonance in this particular difficult time? I mean, in this crisis where we are having to have this conversation from, you know, my uh, guest room in Los Angeles instead of 
in Palo Alto, out in front of the sculpture? I, what do you know, mean I, in this I, difficult time? In this difficult time, it, you know, this is really crazy. I'm, I, I never, this was never on my agenda to do something that was popular. Not that I wouldn't like it, it's just I never expected to, and then I did. And I don't think I can do it again. <laughs> I don't know that, I, you know, it was just, I think luck has, is, is an under uh, theorized thing. And this was a lot of luck. And um, when I look, I, how it, I think it functions now is it's, uh, it, this is really crazy for me to say about any piece of art, let alone my own. It really makes people happy. Yeah, again, never on my agenda, but it does. And the color, everything, the scale, the resonance. And I do think that a lot of its resonance is in the form. It's in the form. Yep. It's the clarity it's of the form. And like the chunkiness and the heaviness and the lightness and, you know. Like it perfect does graphic, graphic composition. I'm sorry, what? It's like a perfect graphic composition. It truly is. And yeah. it, it's just, uh, it's not a particular font, by the way. It's, it's kind of Ed Ruscha's font that got yeah. systematized over these various permutations. Um, and it, it, you know, I still can't believe how it functions on so many levels. But my little secret thing is always pop minimalism and multiculturalism, my three passions. Yeah. Well, I actually think that uh, artwork that makes us happy in this difficult time is actually the perfect end point here. So Deb, I want to thank you so much for doing this with us today. And I look forward to doing another version of it in Palo Alto sometime soon. So, Thank you, stay safe, stay safe everyone, and uh, I hope we're all together again soon. Thank you, Susan, thank you for your vision of this, and thank you everybody for joining in, and it's really been my pleasure.